Hey y'all, it's Derek here, and I'm going to be doing a plan update today just on my collection. Um, if you're new to my channel, you can probably already tell that I'm somewhat of an eclectic collector, and I like to have a little bit of everything, um, but I mainly grow some Hoyas, Orchids, Gizneriads, and a few other plants thrown in. I really love air plants as well. And um, I'm going to be taking a look at all of those, and if you're only interested in a few of those or one of those, I can put timestamps um, in the description for when I start talking about them. Um, but I'll start with Hoyas. Um, I think I have nearly 30 species. Um, most are small, because I didn't seriously start collecting until about 8 months ago. But um, let's take a look at what I got, and I can give you some information on how I'm growing them. I think I'm doing an all right job and um, let's get started. Um, here is Hoya species Pola, which is very similar to the Kenteniana and uh, Yetii, those two species, um, but it has, I believe, smaller flowers and just a little bit different leaves. Um, they're really hard to ID apart from each other unless you really carefully look at photos online and of the flowers. So um, this one I have noticed colors up really light, nicely in the sun. The new growth is pure red. It's really amazing. And um, this used to be a lot bigger, but I actually just recently had a root mealy bugs run through my collection, and those are really hard to deal with. Um, they spread much faster than regular mealybugs and are quite a bit deadlier because you can't catch them early on because uh, they're all at the roots, you can't see them. So what I ended up doing is instead of using pesticides, which are um, very difficult to use with root mealybugs because you're at risk of losing the root system, um, I ended up just chopping up all my plants and throwing out the root system and taking cuttings, which ugh, really hurt, but um, it's been all right. Um, <laughs> got Hoya fungi, which I used to have a, a beautiful large specimen of, and now it's just a bunch of cuttings thrown on everywhere. Um, thankfully, Hoya fungi is a very quick growing species and quick to root and everything, and grows very large leaves. Fungi is also one of the species that can take very low temperatures down to 32 degrees, or so it says online. And thankfully, I already have, if you see there where it's focused, um, I have some tendrils coming out on both cuttings, so I am thankful for that. Um, I had to do the same with all my lacunosas, my retusa here. Um, Lacunosa is a lovely common hoya a lot of you are probably familiar with. Very fragrant, and um, it's just a wonderful, easy plant. Um, this one is Cania kumariana, which I'm very excited about. Didn't get uh, root mealybugs, I just got this cutting. And it's been rooting for about three months. Quite a slow one. But um, I'm not sure if you can see there, but it is starting to put out new growth. So thank God was worried it wasn't going to root because it was one of those old growth cuttings. That's why the leaves are so yellow. They were always yellow right off the plant. Um, a lot of Hoyas, as they get older, some of them at least, the old leaves will turn more succulent and actually um, turn yellow and kind of lose their chlorophyll, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily an unhealthy plant. Um, and to show you a good example of that, let me just try to find my Hoya Platsia. Yeah, here it is, sorry. Um, this one, the leaves were solid yellow when it rooted, and um, they're very thick leaves, and they actually started growing chlorophyll as the rooting, or the cutting started grow roots and everything, so they are a lot more green than they used to be, and I am very happy to see that there are three new growth points on this one. And just to give you an idea of my soil mix, um, I'm kind of changing all the time. Um, there's nothing wrong with using just a standard potting soil mix and perlite. But with this one, I mixed up a soil mix, perlite, a little bit of charcoal, maybe some orchid bark. Because if you didn't know, a lot of Hoyas are epiphytes. 
and they want to drought very quickly because they're growing on other plants in the wild. They're not parasitizing them. Um, they're just using them for support to get to light. And um, yeah, a really chunky mix and some uh, orchid bark, you know, just any bark to throw in that will make it drought a little bit faster will make that plant really happy. Um, over here is Hoya aldrichii, which I'm a little nervous about this one because I've left the media a little too wet for a little too long. Any of these uh, thicker leaved succulent species are really going to want to dry out fast. Um, and yeah, uh, same potting mix and it's put out some nice new growth, a little bit of discoloration, um, some yellow in the way it is, it could either develop into something fungal or it could be a micronutrients deficiency. Like I know um, plants that lack magnesium, which is a main component of chlorophyll, will kind of get more yellow. Not sure if that's going on. And if your plants are looking a little yellow, don't just assume it's magnesium. Make sure you do your research because there's many micronutrients and they are difficult to distinguish from each other, especially if you're not looking into them all. Um, here's Hoya picta, which is a very small leaved species. And this one is just starting to grow roots. And Hoya picta has, I believe, slight splashed leaves, but not much. And it grows beautiful orange flowers. And I heard that they are fragrant of cloves. Um, so that is exciting that it's starting to grow more. Over here, this is a no ID. Um, it may be Hoya honey, um, but without flowers, many Hoyas are not able to be ID. So we'll see. It's definitely not your typical pubic calyx or carnosa. Leaves are very thick and have pretty distinct veining and a distinct uh, texture. Um, oh, almost dropped a plant. Okay. <laughs> Here, um, I've been really loving this one, and it's a bit bigger because it, I did not lose it to root mealybugs. And this is another one of the Kentiana relatives, but this one is named AFF. Dot, um, angustifolia. And so AFF means it's not a accepted name yet, but it is distinct from um, those species. Um, we'll see if it gets separated into its own new name or if it is just a variety of the other species but i believe it doesn't have those dark margins on the ends of the leaves at least in my growing conditions i think with hard light it may develop it and it has nice uh, butterscotch scented flowers just like the others um over here is my hoya Caminiana, and um this is a very lovely species that um is kind of a bush growing like one and it kind of sat in stasis in my care for many months, and it's finally putting out some new growth, which I'm really happy about. And I read online, and I take this with a grain of salt, because I've seen some dissenting opinions, but um, I added some crest, uh, crushed oyster shell, um, because that'll increase, or sorry, yeah, no, increase the pH and make it more alkaline, which apparently this Hoya likes. Again, take it with a grain of salt. Um, most Hoyas are totally happy without um, any alkaline additive to the soil because as epiphytes growing on moss and stuff, most of them are um, in a pretty acidic soil, or not too acidic, but you know, um, rotting moss and everything does make the medium more acidic. But there are certain species that grow on limestone cliffs, and um, I had a hard time finding a list of which ones, um, but they might appreciate an addition of any alkalinity. And um, that being said, Hoyas have grown very well without it, so um, if you're not sure, don't worry about it. I just got this one in a tree. This is Hoya camphorifolia, and it has really beautiful leaves. Apparently when it blooms, it has a weird funky scent that some people um, might not actually like at all but it's not very strong, so that's okay. And the flowers are really beautiful. Ooh, I think that's, oh, nope, that's not new growth. That's a piece of dirt. Okay. <laughs> and 
let's see if I got any more Hoya species to show you. I'm not showing you them all because some of them are just kind of boring or I've shown them before in my last video and not much has changed. Um, here is not a Hoya, but it's a Dyskidia Oenantha white diamond. And this has grown extremely quickly. I've been giving it bright indirect light and it doesn't have nice Hoya flowers, but it certainly has beautiful foliage. Um, and I think some of the leaves can even be all white, but it's very stable variegation. I really haven't had to worry about it reverting or anything like that. So, and, uh, okay, I have two more to show. <laughs> Here's Hoya fitchii, which is a wonderful species that has um, orange and purple flowers in many of the photos I've seen, and it does blush intensely red. Um, the leaves kind of fade back to their green after um, growing bigger though, and lost one leaf on that vine. Um, dropping leaves on new tendrils is common with hoys if your care isn't very good or it's not perfect. Some are more finicky than others. And um, overwatering, underwatering temperatures, many different things could cause it. So if you are losing leaves on your oil, something is wrong and you just got to find out what that is. Over here, the last um, Hoya I'll show you is Hoya Kadata, which has been growing well for me. Um, I got it as a little cutting a few months ago and Unfortunately, the end of the tendril did touch the grow lights, Let's see if it'll focus. Yeah, you can probably see there that it died, but it touched the grow lights and the heat killed it. So if you are using grow lights that aren't extremely cool LEDs or something of the sort, um, be wary of your vines reaching up and getting burned um, because they it, it just takes like a few minutes to a few hours and that tendril's gone. Thankfully, it should branch from here and maybe grow some more leaves there. Um, all right, um, so that's it for the Hoy section of the video. Move on to something I'm really excited about, which is my fra fragrant Talanzia collection. Um, this is Talanzia purpurea. And um, these Talanzias, fragrant Talanzias, are pretty rare, and most you're not going to find in the grocery store, sadly. Um, and they come in all forms that you, if you're not familiar with them, uh, you probably just didn't even know Talanzias could look like that. So a very beautiful spiral. And sorry if I um, forgot to mention the name or if I already did, but this one is Purpurea, and that is because it makes this spike that eventually will turn bright purple and the flowers are intensely fragrant of cinnamon. So that is a lovely plant. Let me just set it down over here. And I also um, have this little wall of fragrant uh, species and hybrids. Just do a quick overview because it's not too easy to look at. Um, this one is a particularly nice one called Marilliana, and it will grow very tall and set out a big white flower that smells very strongly of citrus and like very sweet. So it's just a lovely plant. Um, one of my prized plants in my whole collection, I'd have to say is Talanzia duradii right here. And this plant is uh, unique among many air plants in that it doesn't grow roots. It kind of just vines through trees, latching on with those hook-like leaves. And um, it grows, some uh, Duradii plants are capable of growing absolutely huge, like seven feet tall, and they make tons of purple flowers. And it's also apparently a very easy Talanzia to grow. It's just not very common in the trade. Um, also have another really beautiful fragrant one. Um, this is Talanzia straminia. Let's see if I can get the whole plant in the frame. It's quite large and it kind of just looks like a ghost. And again, it'll put out a large spike of um, purple and white flowers on this one. And they're very fragrant. 
And one of the things I find exciting about um, collecting these Fragrant Tulanzi species is most of them have very different scents, so um, it's just very rewarding to have many with all different uh, smells. Um, here's another form of Straminia. Um, many of these species are very diverse, and so you'll get lots of really different looking plants. This is a vining form of Straminia that can get like three feet long, but just stay this kind of width. And um, I read maybe this uh, Straminia is not fragrant, but I'm not sure, just have to wait for it to bloom. And, um, oh yeah, I didn't really talk about care much for these. Um, many of the very silver species of Tillandsia really um, don't need much water, but that does not mean that they don't need any water at all. Um, here's Tillandsia crocata, giant form, and it grows a pure orange flower, very vibrant and a good size, and it's very fragrant. It's very beautiful. I just grow it hanging upside down like that. Anyway, back to watering. Um, I spray mine um, quite a lot because spraying actually doesn't do much because a lot of the water just evaporates um, before it even gets absorbed by the plant. So if you do not want to soak your plants, you just want to spray, you're going to have to spray like every day. And even then, um, you might have some trouble keeping up with watering, depending on your humidity. And of course, it goes without saying that if you have high humidity, um, my advice isn't going to work for you entirely. Same if you have really low humidity, minus around 60%, so it's, it's good, it's higher on from the mid-range. But um, if you have higher humidity, you're going to water your plants a lot less. And if you have lower humidity, you're going to water more. And something very useful about well, many Tillandsia is that when they get dry, they kind of curl up. So here's back with the large Straminia. Um, when it's dry, these really close around the base. And so I just soaked this last night and see the leaves are, they curved out a lot more. But when it's drier, they close like a flower bud. And um, so when you soak them, you're not gonna want to use tap water because these plants are very sensitive to chlorine and also any salts in the water can clog the pores and just uh, really give your plant a hard time. So um, I like to use drinking water, which seems a little ridiculous. And surely you can use tap water, um, but I just want to give my plants the best that they can have. And I also fertilize at a quarter strength every soaking, and I probably soak about once a week, but again, the plant will tell you when it wants some water and it's getting a little dry. And um, I use a quarter strength fertilizer, and it's important to remember that um, most fertilizers on the market use urea, which needs to be broken down by soil microbes to be available to the plant to soak up. And because air plants don't have any soil, you need to use a fertilizer that's urea free. So orchid fertilizers are often urea free. There's um, also some specific Tillandsia fertilizers online that don't have urea, but always uh, watch for that because it will build up on the plant and possibly poison it. All right. Oh, and I didn't talk about this one. This is a hybrid of crocata, that um, orange flowered one, and caligonosa, which either has a, I think caligonosa has a brown yellowish flower and both are fragrant. And that should bloom soon. Very excited about it, to sniff it because I really only sniffed just a few fragrant Tillandsias before. Um, here is Tillandsia carulia, and this is the last one I'll show you guys. Um, it, I've had this one for probably like two years, and it's somewhat slow growing. I got it from a very small plant though, and it kind of over time can form into a very large bush. And this one apparently once it's large enough, it just starts blooming and keeps on blooming for a long time. And it has those small fragrant purple, purple flowers. And um, I have sniffed that one and it is very nice. It's quite fragrant and pleasant.
All right, that's it for um, Talantias. I'm just going to show you a random plant real quick. This is Serapagia carnosa, which I did a video about. And um, it has just that very bizarre flower um, that captures flies. And it's a very quick growing vine. Um, and yeah, I'd highly recommend if you can get a hold of one. They're quite rare, but very beautiful. Um, let me show you some of the orchids I've been having some fun with. Um, what actually got me really into plants was orchids many years ago, and I kind of just fell out of love with them because I discovered kids near yats, which are so much easier to grow in bloom. Um, that being said, orchids are not impossible by any means. Um, I just found Gizneritz to be much faster. Anyway, this is Angracum aloefolium, and this is almost, well, I won't say this is its maximum size by any means, because it does get a bit larger, but this is a super miniature orchid that will grow a large white flower with a long spur, and it's pollinated by moths at night, and it's night fragrant, and it has, um, the, the species is named Aloefolium because um, it looks like a little aloe. Let's put that back up. Here got Arangus punctata, which is one of my favorite plants of all time because this is its maximum adult size and it will bloom at this size and the flower, and it's capable of producing many, is actually the size of one of those leaves there. And it has a very long spur, um, up to four inches, which just makes it look really elegant and wild. This one is trickier to grow. You want to be really careful. Um, most people recommend growing it mounted and just having the roots completely exposed to air because it's that sensitive. But I'm growing it in this little bead pot I made um, that has a lot of airflow. And it's just cork bark in here, so I'm hoping that will be enough airflow for the plant to do well. And um, last orchid I'll show you because they're just spread around and it's kind of a hassle to <laughs> find them for you. Um, this is a new one I got as well. This is Angreek um, um, Aperoides, which it's called Aperoides because um, I forgot the actual genus name, but Aperoides, the oides means looks alike, and there's a genus of Dendrobium which has these very unusual leaves for an orchid. And so this is the Angracum that looks like that genus of Dendrobium, or subgenus, excuse me. And so this eventually kind of grows all around and gets longer, and it has these tiny little flowers that apparently smell like gardenias. So very excited to keep growing that one. And then let me move on to the last bit of plants I'll be showing you. And I am really surprised these are not more popular. They are Gesner ants. And I mean, I guess I have a few ideas why. Um, their leaves are a bit brittle, so I think um, nurseries don't really like shipping them because they're uh, prone to breaking in a box and stuff. Um, that being said, they're really easy to grow and they bloom really incredibly and easily. And I only have one plant to show you that's in bloom. Let me find it real quick. God, I'm so disorganized, sorry. All right, here it is. So this is, or let me bring it up to the better light. This is Calaria strawberry shortcake. Has, let me sit down, a little shaky too. <laughs> Has beautiful um, dots on the flower. And it's um, tubular, super fuzzy, and nearly black foliage. As you can see, it's just loaded with buds, so it's going to be quite a nice blooming show. And this one is one of the more compact hybrids of Calaria. And um, so it'll just bloom at this size. Um, that being said, Calaria come in many different shapes and sizes. And um, my favorite variety I have right now, if I can say that I have a favorite at least, 
is Cholaria amabilis bogotensis, which is right here, and it is caught in a philodendron. <laughs> so let's bring it over here. And as you can see, it has very um, fuzzy, beautiful silver leaves. And give me one moment to untangle that so I can show you in better light. There we go. So very, very glorious silver leaves and um, just a very nice growth habit. And this one is loaded with flower buds. So each little stem has six or more. I think I counted one with nine buds. So that is going to be quite a shocking display when it's in bloom. I'm growing this in a shallow but very large pot. I like to grow Calaria in just a normal potting mix with tons of perlite added, uh, 40 to 50%, I'd say, because um, they grow kind of just like under trees in the forest and stuff, some more in open clearings, so they get a lot of bright light. Um, they do not mind direct sun for an hour or two a day. It actually helps them bloom a lot. And um, I have another really large one that's just about to bloom. I can just show you how large it is and how nice the leaves are before it kind of starts blooming. And um, as you can see, tons of flowering buds on this really just gargantuan beast. And to be honest, these are actually not the largest Calaria. Some of them grow many feet tall and are really inconvenient for us houseplant growers, but um, still very nice. And so um, back down to these, um, just take a better look at them. These are some Calaria seedlings that I grew, um, and their mama is actually the Amabilis bogotensis hybrid. So you can see um, a few of the seedlings actually inherited that silver, and the other parent had a red edge on the leaves, so I'm very happy to see that at least a few of them have dark leaves with that beautiful red color. Um, some of them turned out completely green like the the dab and this one is another completely green one video just stopped recording for a bit so coming back to where we left off um this hybrid grew really really large dark leaves get in some better light here so just a stunning plant i'm really excited because these are starting to grow buds as well and kind of see them tucked in there and it does look like there's going to be some with at least three buds on each axle, maybe more. Um, but yeah, we'll see where that goes. And um, this turned out to be actually a really long video. <laughs> so um, I'll call it done there. Um, I really appreciate you guys watching. Um, if you enjoyed it, please leave a like. And... If you have any questions, feel free to ask me in the comments or message me on Instagram. You can find me at Creekside Plants, or Creekside underscore plants, excuse me. And if you want to see more from me, um, please subscribe to my channel. I've um, been posting pretty inconsistently, um, just because those root mealybugs really knocked me out. And I feel, I just didn't feel like I had anything very interesting to show. Um, I hope I was able to find some cool stuff to show you guys in this one. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye.